Hey programmers, Alvin here. Welcome back to another episode of our Data Structures and Algorithms course. And as promised, this time I'll walk you through permutations. So if you haven't already, you'll definitely want to check out our previous episode on combinations because this permutations algorithm is going to be very, very similar in logic. Basically, it just builds up on top of that previous combination logic. So that means we have one single objective for today, and that would be to actually implement permutations code, right? We'll also want to do along the way is, of course, visualize the process that we can use and really understand how we can generate permutations. So let's start with a very simple definition. What actually is a permutation, right? So a permutation is going to be a collection of items where the order matters, right? This is kind of just like the opposite of combinations, right? If you recall with our combinations, a combination is a collection where the order does not matter. In a permutation, it definitely does matter. So let's look at an example to make sense of this. Say you were given an initial set of three items, A, B, and C. That means that these are all of the possible permutations you can generate among those three elements, right? What you notice here is we just have to mix the order of these three elements. So something I just want to point out for now is in our current definition for permutations, we'll kind of take it to mean that for every single permutation, we're definitely taking uh, every element. So you notice that each of these permutations have all three elements. We're just choosing about uh, the order among those elements, right? If you compare this to our previous combination logic, in combinations, we had the decision of whether or not we include an element. In permutations, it's a little different. We're definitely going to include the element, but we're just choosing where to put it exactly, right? So with that in mind, how does the number of elements in our starting set actually dictate uh, the number of permutations? Well, I'll tell you off the bat that if you're given a set of n things, they're actually n factorial different permutations, right? And of course, the huge mystery is why is it n factorial? Recall that like three factorial will be something like three times two times one, which is why there are exactly six permutations over here. So to actually understand why we get n factorial uh, different permutations, let's actually draw this decision process. So here I have a nice tree diagram of how we can actually generate uh, all possible permutations. If you look at the very bottom level of this tree in green, uh, these six different nodes represent all six different permutations, right? Similar to our combinations diagram, what you notice is along the side, I'm kind of denoting the current elements that I'm choosing for, right? So I have a master set of three things, A, B, and C. And in the long run, what I wanna do is make a decision for each of them. So let's start stepping through this. So at the very top, we have an empty permutation. And in the long run, we have to make a decision for our differing elements, right? So on the very top level, we make a decision about A. And really, decisions basically are already preordained, right? Uh, for our permutations, like we said previously, you must always take the element. It's really about the order that you take the elements, right? And where you put them. So if we have an initially empty uh, permutation, for A, we actually just automatically take A, and there it is, right? But then from there, we have A in our permutation. I must make another decision for B. And this actually gets interesting because for B, I now choose where to put B. In other words, you can put B before the A over here, or you can put the B after the A and it goes over here, right? So if I start at this node, if I go to the left, I'm putting B before the A. If I go to the right, I'm putting B after the A. And the logic follows similarly down to our next level for C, right? If I just consider this node in a similar way, I consider all the possible places I can insert C, right? I can insert C before the B, between the B and the A, or just after the A. And that will actually give us all three of these different nodes. Important thing to notice here is you're inserting C among these already existing elements, right? So if I put C at the start, it's C, B, A, right? The order among the B and the A is still preserved. If I insert C in the middle, then it's B, C, A again. B and A are still in the same order. And if I insert C at the very end, it's B, A, C again. I preserve the order among my previous elements, right? B, A, and then just adding that C additionally. Now, of course, I have very symmetric logic for this branch of my tree, right? This time I'm inserting C among A and B. So I can again put it before, between, or after. That's why we end up with all of these different uh, permutations. Again, the final permutations are just the nodes in green at the very bottom. So with that in mind, uh, why do we actually get a factorial number of different permutations? Well, you can probably already see the pattern over here, right? Let's say for my first element, there's actually only one option we had, right? If you're gonna take A, you actually just kind of take it. Position and order are sort of a relative thing. So if you have nothing to begin with uh, in your starting permutation, there's only one place to put A. 
But now that you have the actual A, when you choose for the B, you can put the B before the A or after the A. So that gives you two options on this next level. And now that you're inserting C, there are actually three different places you can insert that C among uh, the B and the A or the A and the B. And that'd give you three options over here. And if you added more and more elements to your, like your master set of items, what you'll have is a factorial, right? You just multiply these things together. I have one option of placement for my first element. I have two options for my second element. I have three options for my third element and so on. And that's definitely an N factorial pattern. All right, now that we have the pen and paper process down for generating permutations, let's actually write the code. Right now, I wanna write a function that takes in an array of my starting elements and returns a 2D array representing all possible permutations, right? So this should be the output uh, for my function. It's a 2D array where every subarray represents just one of those permutations. Cool, so let's jump right in. I'll start defining this function. It's gonna take in my initial elements and what I'll do is, of course, solve this one recursively. I think a recursive a permutation solution is actually the most straightforward one to understand and actually implement. So since I've chosen to solve this one recursively, let me start by thinking about my base case, right? I know that my base case should be about the trivially small uh, input. If my input over here is an array, what would be the trivially small array? In most scenarios, it's going to be the empty array. So let me actually think about that scenario in isolation. So if someone gave me uh, an empty array as my initial starting set of elements, they're basically asking me, hey, generate all permutations of this uh, empty set of things. And to me, I think it would be safe to sort of return an empty 2D array, very similar to what we did in our combinations logic, right? There's technically only one permutation, the permutation containing no elements, right? Cool. And so jumping back into our actual function, let's write that base case. So if you have no elements, so if elements.length is zero, then return your empty 2D array. Cool, so there's my empty 2D array. And now from here, I need to write a recursive case that makes progress toward this base case, right? So in the long run, what I'm looking for is some logic that maybe calls permutations with a smaller subarray, right? Uh, following our very similar logic to what we did in combinations, what I can do is just choose, let's pick out uh, just the first element of the array. So just breaking it down to some variable names, I'll say, here's my first element, and I'll grab it as elements at index zero. Nothing too fancy. And then from there, let's also slice the original elements array, grabbing the rest of the elements. So we can say elements.slice starting index one. Right? So notice that this rest array would contain all elements excluding the very first one. Right? Slice returns you a copy of the array. So at this point, let's actually call permutations and pass in the rest of the array. So an important thing to notice here is this subarray that I'm passing recursively uh, does not include my first element. So if I do like my recursive leap of faith over here, I assume that this call actually works, right? So it should return uh, an array containing all possible permutations. And what I know for a fact is the permutations I get back over here will definitely not include the first element at all, right? So I'll call this my perms without first, right? So it's all of my permutations that don't include my first element. According to our definition for permutations, we know that our final permutations must contain all possible elements, right? So I definitely need to incorporate this first element. If you recall uh, what we did in our diagram, for the element that we're considering, all we have to kind of do is insert this element in all possible positions, right? So now that I have my permutations that don't contain the first element, what I'll do is I'll iterate over them, right? So let me iterate over these permutations. And for each of those permutations, we'll call it, I wanna do some logic, right? So what I'm doing over here is I'm grabbing a permutation, and I know that this permutation does not include uh, the first element. And what I wanna do is actually choose all possible insertion positions for my first element into uh, this permutation. So what I'll need to do is actually iterate through all possible insertion positions, right? So if you go back to my diagram, let's say my current permutation is this BA. What I need to do is iterate through all possible insertion positions. So I need to iterate at that zero position, the one position, and even at the two position tailing at the very end, right? So notice that there are two elements in this uh, permutation, but I need to kind of get three iterations out of it because I need to also do the insertion that comes like after uh, the A. 
So I'll just write that in my logic. So for this permutation, I'm going to write a classic for loop that iterates through the different indices of this permutation. So the first index is zero, that'd be inserting in the front. And I want to go up to and also uh, including the length of this current permutation. Recall that perm will be a array, right? So I'll just do I plus plus here. And again, I need to do the uh, less than or equal to because I need to actually insert at the very tail end of this current permutation. Cool, and at this point, what I can do is just write my logic for actually inserting uh, my first element. So a nice trick I can do is just use some slicing. So I can say, here is my perm width first. So this is gonna be one permutation. Notice there's no S here. And it's definitely gonna contain the first element. So let me create a new permutation. And what I wanna do is write logic that inserts my first element at position I, right? So what I can do is spread out the elements from my original permutation, but only up to the ith index, right? So this gives me the elements from zero up to index i, not including index i. And then after that chunk, I'll actually throw down my first element. And then after the first element, I need to include all of the elements from my original uh, permutation that come after and including uh, the i index, just like this. So if you uh, consider this entire line 11 in totality, what it does is it creates a new permutation where I've inserted my first element at position i. So maybe you're a little unfamiliar with this combined JavaScript syntax. Let me quickly step through it uh, in the node REPL. So looking at the right-hand side right now, let's say I have this array of, let's say, five elements. Let me also create i, and we'll just say it's index two, right? So this i, this value of two, represents the index of this c. So I'm trying to insert some new element at that index, right? So if I kind of rewrite this pattern over here, I'm creating a new array literal. And what I do is I take the elements of my original array, but only from the beginning all the way up to the ith index. And you can already see what that gives back. It's kind of dimmed out, but I get all the elements before position i. And then what I can do is insert a new element. Here I'll insert like an x, and I'll pull x right there. And then from that point, I need to just grab all the elements that were at position i through the end, right? So I could use very similar logic and say spread out array dot slice starting at index i and if i don't give in second argument here it slices all the way through the end and here's my final output right the effect that this pattern had uh, on my new array was it just inserted x at position i cool so that's all i'm doing over here and now that i've actually generated this uh, permutation that definitely includes the first element because i see it right there uh, all i need to do is actually add that permutation to some like master collection so let me create an array i'll say uh, permutations let me say all permutations just to kind of have a, have a unique name and i'll create an emptier over here and as i generate all of my permutations in this inner loop i will just do all permutations dot push and I'll push this single uh, permutation, which definitely has the first element. Cool, and like you probably guessed, uh, to end this code, all I need to do is just return all of those permutations. Again, a really key important thing to understand about this code is, it is the case that every permutation must contain every element. I'm just kind of varying along the order of those elements. So let's give this a shot. Let me console.log this example over here. So what are all permutations of ABC? Let's see if this works. There I have all six of those different permutations. Awesome. And so to really understand what's happening here, let's kind of uh, take a, a frozen moment in time. Let me say I also call uh, permutations of just BC, because we know that that's actually what's gonna happen inside of the logic, right? When we make our top level call to permutations of ABC, we know that we're gonna grab and kind of reserve first element as just the A, and when we grab the rest, that refers to BC. So that really refers to this function call over here. This recursive function call would just be exactly this code over here, right? Just calling on BC. So if I look at the second line over here, this 2D array represents all permutations of just BC, right? And then from there, how do I actually incorporate my first element? Well, my first element was A. All I do is take that A and insert it in all possible positions for each of these permutations, right? So let's say I consider just this permutation that does not uh, contain the first element, A. What I do is I can insert A at the very start. That would give me this permutation over here. Again, if I grabbed uh, this permutation, I inserted A in the middle, that would give me BAC. 
If I took a and insert at the end of this, that would give me this one. And the same hold true for this separate permutation over here, right? If I have the original permutation of just CB, if I insert A at the start, I get ACB, and the logic follows all the way through. So let's make this one official by doing the complexity analysis. So if we consider the time first, I will say that N is the length of the original elements array. You guessed it, the time complexity is going to be O of N factorial, right? If you recall from our big O lectures, N factorial is essentially like the worst uh, complexity we'll ever arrive at. And it makes sense that we have N factorial here because we expect to generate N factorial different things, right? This code has a combination of a recursive logic, as well as a lot of iterations as well, right? So hopefully you realize that we're gonna get N factorial just from the tree diagram we drew earlier. Now, in terms of the space complexity, what we need to consider is at first, at least the stack frames that we have. So I know that my base case is about the empty array. And when I make a recursive call, the array I pass down will have one less element in length, right? So we know that there are n different stack frames before we bottom out at our base case. So we know that we have n different stack frames. And now we have to consider if there are any additional uh, sources of space that we use within each of those stack frames, right? So I need to multiply over here. And what I'll need to consider is this slice, right? So I know that this slice uh, creates a copy of the original array with just one element, but we know in the worst case, it essentially has a new array of length n, right? So in other words, the rest variable in the worst case will be of n length. So we know there are n stack frames, each of which would have a rest array of n elements, right? So n times n, which would give us n squared uh, in terms of the space complexity. So there we have it, we implemented permutations together. So key things I want you to take away from this lesson is that if you're given n things, they are n factorial different permutations, right? You'll definitely also wanna understand how to visualize the process for generating permutations in terms of that tree diagram, right? What you have to remember is for one permutation to the next, what you have to do is insert this element in all possible positions, right? So that's all I got for this one. I'll turn it over to you. What you wanna do is head down to the link in the description below and head to coderbyte.com where you can actually practice all of these different things. I'll see you in the next one.